Hello to everyone from around the world joining us today. I am Asim Hussain, and I'm thrilled to welcome you all once again to another installment in the QuantumScape webinar series. Before we start, um, as a public company, I'm obliged to tell you that any type of forward-looking statements that we make, such as projections of our technology performance, models, targets, plans, and the like, are all subject to changes and risks that we have more fully described in our SEC filings. I'd like to share that this webinar will be posted to quantumscape.com as well as quantumscape's YouTube channel after the event concludes today. Also, please feel free to submit questions anytime during the webinar by using the ask question function found on your console. And you can also adjust um, the tools in the console to fit your viewing preferences as you watch. So to start, let's talk a little bit about the history of ceramics. Ceramics are some of the oldest materials in human history. The oldest ones date back to the Paleolithic era, uh, 28,000 BC. However, ceramics are more than just clay pots and fine tools. The age of technical ceramics began around 1850 um, with the introduction of porcelain and electrical insulators. Ceramics are now used in a wide variety of applications, taking advantage of properties such as chemical and thermal stability. Ceramics are critical to many technologically advanced fields, including electronics, optoelectronics, medical, energy, automotive, and other advanced fields. Now, what's more, new ceramic processing and characterization techniques have led us to novel materials with tailored properties that meet specific and custom use cases. Traditional ceramics are made by mixing clay with water, shaping the resulting mixture, and firing the final form to make a variety of useful objects. But this doesn't begin to capture the complex procedures required for today's advanced high quality ceramics. For me personally, uh, before I joined QuantumScape, I was at a company called Bloom Energy where we were making fuel cells. And we actually used a solid state ceramic separator uh, there as well, which is manufactured today in scale for Bloom Energy's products. Um, my career kind of followed that solid state separator theme. And here we are in QuantumScape where we're also using a solid state separator ceramic material. So, QuantumScape solid state lithium metal battery technology hinges on our proprietary solid ceramic separator that has the right features to let it lithium ions flow through while blocking battery killing dendrites. And today I am joined by Niall Donnelly, QuantumScape's Vice President of Research and Development to learn more about ceramics development, manufacturing, and some of the keys to using ceramics in next generation batteries. So with that, now why don't we just start with your background before you came to QuantumScape? Sure. Well, I started my career like many other material scientists in a different field, and I ended up migrating into material science. I did uh, undergraduate in physics at Queen's University in Belfast in Northern Ireland, and then I stayed in that same institution to do a PhD in ferroelectric materials, which are a unique class of, of materials as well. And towards the end of my PhD, I had the opportunity to move to the US for a research position at Penn State University. And this was a great opportunity for me because Penn State has a great history in ferroelectrics in particular, but also in ceramic science and engineering. So it was a tough decision, but I uh, had to say goodbye to my family and friends, but I moved over to Penn State for an 18 month contract. And that was in 2004. So 18 months turned into uh, many years and I spent uh, a very productive time in the lab at Penn State, learning about ceramics, doing experiments, a lot of hands-on experimentation, reading, going to conferences, uh, meeting industrial scientists. So it was a great learning experience, and it was a springboard for me to get into the startup scene in California, which I moved out west, and after a year or two, I met up with the Kwanski people, and I've been there now for 10 years. Great, so maybe let's talk a little bit about what your role is here today. And how have QuantumScape ceramics activities evolved as you've been here? Well, when I joined the company, uh, my first responsibility was to set up uh, rudimentary ceramic processing with the company. 
and that's what I did. I set up some you know, rudimentary ball mills and some, um, you know, processing furnaces for ceramic materials. And then the, you know, the uh, project got a little bit of traction. We started to see some um, real results. And so we started to expand the, the, the team and we hired lots of new ceramic engineers, veterans from industry, um, new fresh scientists. And we built up a really core discipline in uh, ceramic science. Um, so the team has grown immensely. Today I lead uh, electrolyte development. We have over 60 engineers and scientists all working in uh, ceramic processing, research and development. And on top of that, a much larger team working in uh, scaling up the manufacturing of ceramic technology. So we've really grown a lot from our early days with small furnaces to today having huge uh, batch furnaces and large continuous kilns for high volume ceramic manufacturing. Great. So, you know, taking a step back for everybody who actually isn't that familiar with ceramics themselves, and this is Ceramics 101. So what is a ceramic? Let's just start there. What is a ceramic? Sometimes it's easier to talk about what's not a ceramic. Ceramics are not metals. They're not polymers or plastics. They're not glass. Um, the most common types of ceramics that we see in the world around us, like you mentioned, are derivatives of pottery, and that technology goes back you know, thousands of years. Early man learned how to form clay into a shape and put it in a fire and harden it, and that's the basis of modern-day ceramic uh, pottery and all those sort of applications that derive from that, tiles, um, dishware, all the, uh, the tableware that you have, um, all sorts of ceramic products in buildings, um, all the things you use in the bathroom are generally all made of porcelain. Um, and that, you know, there's a, a vast array of technologies that are based around traditional ceramics. And more recently, we have what we call the modern ceramics. But what they all have in common, I think, is two things. Most ceramics are polycrystalline inorganic materials. So what does that mean? Well, at this microstructure, you will find that crystalline materials are ordered structures. So there's a, a very discrete array of atoms in a very particular structure, organized carefully and uh, over a long range. And that contrasts to amorphous materials, which have completely random structure like glass. So ceramics are generally all crystalline, but they're also polycrystalline. So what does that mean? Well, if you look at a ceramic under a microscope at very high magnification, you will see that there are lots of little building blocks called grains, ceramic grains. And each one of these grains is a crystalline, a single crystal uh, crystallite. And when you put these all together, they form a polycrystalline structure. So why aren't they a single crystal? It's because each one of these little grains is slightly oriented differently to its neighbor. And when they meet, they form an interface called the grain boundary. So a ceramic is essentially lots of grains separated by grain boundaries. And then the inorganic part, well, that means it's not organic, it's not biological. If you take a metal and a non-metal from the periodic table, you pretty much start forming inorganic compounds. So if you have an inorganic compound like magnesium oxygen, magnesium oxide, and it has a polycrystalline structure, the chances are that's a ceramic material. Got it. So what are the key properties of ceramics and where are ceramics used in other high-tech industries? Well, because there's such a diversity of chemistry on the periodic table, you can form all sorts of different inorganic compounds. And as you can imagine, there's all sorts of different properties of those materials. This is one of the things I love about ceramics. They have a vast array of functional properties. So for example, electronic properties. Ceramics can be insulators. They can be um, very high uh, voltage stable materials like porcelain that's used in high voltage transmission cables, very insulating, not conductive. On the other hand, there could be more exotic materials that have very unique properties because of the, the crystalline structure. For example, zinc oxide is a, can be a semiconducting material and it has a very unique property at the grain boundaries where with a larger voltage, it the, the electrons will actually jump across the grain boundaries. And this is used in a, in a, in a material called a varistor. Um, so when at low voltages, the varistor has very high impedance, but as the voltage rises, those grain boundaries become conducting and it allows the electrons to tunnel across. So the varistor is used in circuits to protect it from an, a, a voltage pulse or a power surge. When the, the circuit's operating normally, you get um, a high resistance on your varistor and the current just flows down to the circuit. But when there's a voltage surge, the varistor starts to conduct, the electrons tunnel across the grain boundaries in the zinc oxide and you get low impedance. And now the the, all the current flows through the varistor. So that's a very unique property of the microstructure 
uh, of, a, of the zinc oxide material. So again, a very interesting use of ceramics. They also have um, important thermal properties. So most ceramics are insulators. So they're used, for example, on the space shuttle to um, shield against high temperatures on re-entry. You also have uh, ceramics used in kiln furniture to you know, insulate the furniture and the heat. Optical properties. Ceramics, most of them look opaque, but if you process the ceramic carefully, you can actually eliminate all the porosity out of the system and it becomes transparent to light. And then you can use it for exotic applications like lasing media, and you can form a laser beam through the ceramic itself. Mechanical properties. Ceramics can be engineered to be very, very hard, um, so they can resist fracture, resist damage, used, for example, in, in body armor. Uh, one of the applications that I was involved in uh, many years ago was in dielectrics. Ceramics have or can be engineered with very high dielectric constants, so they can make very small capacitors with high capacitance. A very um, high-tech use of ceramics today is in multi-layer ceramic capacitor technology. This is a, a big industry. It involves making very thin layers of ceramic material on the order of about one micron thick, which in contrast to what Sir Quantum Scape does today is very, very thin. Our layers of our ceramic are 20 microns to 40 microns. The MLCC industry has been making layers on the order of one or two microns now for years. So it's a very advanced, um, high-tech application of ceramics to make a relatively low-cost part. And ceramic capacitors are made in, in the billions of parts per year, and they only cost a few cents. Uh, another application that I've worked on in the past is piezoelectric materials. And these are fascinating materials because when you apply a voltage to a piezoelectric material, it changes shape and it gets a little bit longer. And you can use that to um, make little motors, make little actuators, little displacement devices. And of course, if you apply an oscillating voltage to it, it will actually vibrate. And so you can use that phenomenon to make a little microphone or a little piezoelectric speaker. And at high enough frequency, that vibration is ultrasonic. And you can use that to make an ultrasonic transducer. So most of us, if you have kids, the first picture you have of your kid was not taken with a cell phone, it was taken with an ultrasonic uh, imaging device, which probably contained a piezoelectric ceramic material to generate that ultrasonic vibration. And finally, ionic properties. So ceramics can have um, you know, unique properties where they can conduct atoms or ions through the structure um, in contrast to electrons. And this is, again, a much more modern exotic use of ceramic technology, and it is, of course, the property that Quantumscape has taken advantage of in our separator. Right. I guess we're exposed to ceramics being used in so many applications without even realizing it in most right, cases. Right. Yeah. Um, so then coming back to, you know, what are some of the common steps to actually make ceramics? Like, what are those key process steps look like? Well, because of the vast array of different um, devices and applications that we just mentioned, there are, of course, a, a vast array of different methods of making ceramics, and they're all unique to the particular um, device that you're going to make. But I think there's a fundamental commonality to most ceramic processing. You typically start off with some raw materials, and from those you mix them together and form the initial precursor powder that's going to become your ceramic. Um, once you have your powder, that needs to be transformed into some shape. So whatever shape your final product needs to be, you've got to transform your powders into that shape. Sometimes that's simple, like pouring a powder into a dye and then pressing it at high pressure to form a, a dense powder compact. Uh, sometimes you can actually take the powder, suspend it in a liquid, often water, sometimes a solvent. And then now that you have this suspended powder, which we call a slurry, you can fill that into a mold, you can extrude that uh, into a tube, or you can cast it into a sheet with a, a technology called tape casting. But in, any, in all these cases, you end up with a, basically a powdered compact of material, which is not a ceramic yet. This is what we call the green body. It's the precursor to the ceramic. To finally turn your green body into the final ceramic material, it needs to go through one more step, a heat treatment step. And that, again, can be done in a number of different ways. You can have uh, fast, slow processes. You can have processes under pressure, under no pressure. You can do it in a uh, gas environment or just in air. You can even do exotic things like apply an electric voltage and a current to the material to help heat it up. But in all cases, you're trying to accomplish the same thing, which is to raise the temperature of your powder 
to roughly 80 or 90 percent of its melting point and at that point the particles which are loosely bound now start to fuse together and that process continues with more time and temperature until all the free space all the porosity is expelled and those particles now start to really fuse together and form that crystalline polycrystalline structure that we showed in the earlier micrograph and when you cool that down you're left with your process ceramic material so now coming to QuantScape, what makes our ceramic solid state separator so unique? And I think one of the most uh, interesting things that I found um, is the fact that it's also flexible, yet it's hard at an atomic scale. So could you talk a little bit about now QuantScape itself? Sure. In terms of the ceramic? So I think we've done some remarkable things with the quantum scape separator to um, make it a usable product for solid state batteries. Of course, one of the first things you need is high conductivity. And our material has been engineered to have that conductivity that at, a, at a sufficient level that we can pass a lot of current through it and achieve high charge rates in the final battery design. But high, high conductivity in the material itself is not the only requirement. <clears throat> you also need to have low uh, resistance with the other components in the battery. So the separator is only one component. You also have, in our case, a lithium metal anode and a cathode material, which can you know, be comprised of different things. But your separator must have low impedance with both those other um, uh, items in, in the battery. And it's taken us a lot of time to understand the, the fundamental uh, sources of resistance that um, cause that ASR, that area-specific resistance between your, your different interfaces. But over time, we've managed to, to really bring that down. And today, it's almost um, immeasurable, the, or the impedance between our separator and the lithium metal, which I think is a really big advantage for, for high rate capability. The other thing that you get for free with ceramics is thermal stability. So you know, ceramics are all high temperature materials. When you heat them up, you know, they don't do anything until they get very, very hot near their melting point, and that's usually over a thousand degrees. And you can compare that to a lithium ion battery today, which has a polymeric separator that will melt at a few hundred degrees, and then you get catastrophic failure of the device. That won't happen at a few hundred degrees with a ceramic separator. It's very stable over a broad temperature range. Of course, they're also chemically stable. So again, having a uh, material in contact with lithium metal for a long period of time is a very aggressive environment. Lithium is a very reactive chemical, very reactive metal, and it will attack and react with many, many different uh, ceramic materials. Our particular ceramic we've seen is very stable against lithium metal over a very long time, and also against the cathode components as well. And then finally, to your original question, how is our ceramic so flexible? Because all the ceramics we talked about earlier, um, porcelain, mm -hmm. plates, vases, they're all very rigid uh, materials, and they're all ceramic. Ceramics are, are inherently stiff materials. So how do they become flexible? The secret is make them thin. You can take a lot of different stiff materials, ceramics, glass. If you reduce the thickness sufficiently, you can reach the point where they become flexible. So one of the big innovations at QuantumScape has been learning how to process our ceramic material in such a way that we can make it very thin without um, suffering any you know, major deficiencies. Uh, and that's taken a long time to do, um, but now we have it under 100 microns. A lot of our uh, separators we make today are somewhere between 20 to 40 microns thick. And you find that um, at that level of thickness, they now have a certain amount of flexibility. The, the other thing you need to achieve that is a low level of defectivity. Surface scratches, pits, flaws, any of those things would be stress concentrators. And when you start to flex a material that's full of defects, you'll instantly propagate a crack. So the fact that we can flex our material is a good indication that we've reached a low level of effectivity as well. So along the same lines, I, I think you begin to touch on it, but what are some of the challenges in actually manufacturing and then scaling this kind of um, you know, ceramic separator manufacturing thing? Sure. Scale up is, is indeed a challenge. In, in fact, I, it brings me back to my grad school days when I was a student and I would be at a conference presenting and you know, I would be very proud of my, my PowerPoint slide, and I would be talking about how this is a you know look at my breakthrough um, material here. 
And I would always get the same question, usually from industrial scientists. Well, your work is great, but does it scale? And the truth is, at the time, I didn't know what that, that really meant. But now, having gone through the process over the last 10 years of QuantScape, I can tell you that scaling is indeed a very difficult challenge, and it brings about a whole set of new challenges. Um, it's not simply about the first result, or it's not about um, proving one data point on a chart. You've got to get reproducibility. Mm -hmm. You know, when you start off with small scale experiments, the, the thing you need to establish is high degree of reproducibility in your results. Can, it's not about making one data point, but can you make another 10 data points that line up exactly with the first one? You've got to understand all the variables that go into your, your final data point and what are the factors that cause uh, changes in that. And when you do that at small scale, then you are armed with the right knowledge to try and take it to large scale. Because at large scale, things change. You will be changing equipment. You'll be going from a small furnace to a large furnace. Is the environment the same? Is the gas flow the same? Are the heating conditions going to be the same? Uh, if you don't understand the requirements for a small scale, you'll never be able to do it at the large scale. Uh, for raw materials, for example, you might start off buying one kilogram of material from vendor A. But when you go to large scale, you may need a thousand kilograms of material right. from vendor B. Are they the same? Well, the spec sheet says they're both 99% pure, but what's in the other 1%? That, you know, if, if they're not the same, those impurities could kill you. You know, mm -hmm. it, it all comes down to, you know, do you understand the effect of all these different variables on your process and on your final product? And that's where all the hard work goes in mm -hmm. in the early days is to understand all those variables. And if you've done a good job with that, then you will have more success transferring to large scale. It's not always easy. You're going to have lots of challenges along the way. But the more prep work you've done, the more you've understood your material, the better chance you have of success. Right. And that sort of aligns with the way we're transitioning from you know, R&D equipment to doing the pre-pilot line that we're building out here at QS0 Zero exactly. Campus. Right? Yeah. OK, so. Um, you know, as as we're trying to scale up, you know, the new ceramic materials are deploying EV batteries. Um, what has our approach been to allow us to make so much progress over the last decade as we've worked through this? Yeah, well, I think the key to, you know, rapid innovation is rapid iteration. Mm -hmm. You've got to learn very quickly. Um, you've got to execute experiments and get definitive answers from those experiments. And it's not easy. Um, you know, I think you have to hire smart people. Smart people will generate ideas. Ideas should never be a problem. You know, ideas are like lottery tickets. They're easy to come by, but only a few of them will ever turn into winners. Um, how do you turn an idea into you know, a, a great result? It's by very good execution, experimental execution. You've got to plan experiments well. You've got to execute them skillfully, and then you've got to analyze the results statistically, and finally, you generate useful knowledge. The, the goal of all experimentation should be to generate useful knowledge. Right. And then, as your knowledge grows, you, you get new learnings, and with every new learning, you can finally reach a new plateau of understanding, and from there, you're able to see your end result. So you've got to keep your team focused, pushed in the same direction with, with a lot of new learnings and um, a lot of carefully executed experiments, you can move your knowledge in the right direction and eventually you'll reach your, your goal. Yeah, and I think, you know, especially now at this stage, maybe you could just also touch on the fact that, okay, you know, you're doing the research and development, but now you're transferring to the manufacturing team. So we're going from experimenting, locking in aspects that truly work, and then pushing them through. But who are the key groups that you're interacting with all the time at QuantumScape in order to ensure that that handoff is now happening for the scaling that's occurring at QS0? Sure. I mean, QuantumScape, I think, has done a great job in assembling different teams that complement each other. So, of course, there's the R&D team, um, which do fundamental ceramic processing and develop new materials and processes, which is the team that I'm working with. There's also the manufacturing team, which are operating larger scale tools, uh, taking the processes that R&D develop and then scaling them up and understanding how to transfer them into larger furnaces, how to use you know, those materials from different suppliers. Um, we have a fantastic metrology team. It's also something that we've done a great job of doing is to build up a lot of in-house uh, metrology capability. 
Um, we've got a huge suite of analytical equipment and a lot of uh, you know, high, uh, well-educated engineers and scientists operating those tools. That's been a huge advantage, and that's something that you know, speeds up the, um, the innovation cycle. If you had to outsource all your metrology and all your characterization, it would take you know, much, much longer to get that feedback. But by having those tools in-house, you get a very fast turnover in experimentation and, and rapid feedback. So metrology has been a big advantage to the company. Um, the engineering and uh, manufacturing team have been you know, crucial. We have uh, a great hardware team that helps us. You know, there's so many tools involved in ceramic processing that um, it takes you know, a, a whole battery of, of engineers and to keep these things moving, to, to repair items when they come down, to bring in new tools and install them. Um, you have, of course, in the COVID area, uh, era, a long uh, problem with supply chains. So we always run into, we need this part, we need that chemical, and COVID hasn't helped that at all. So we need a supply chain team that helps manage the inventory of all the new materials as well. So, um, it, you know, we've got a broad, a big, big company now with a lot of different divisions, and we all work, um, you know, collectively to try and get the job done. Great. So we're starting to get some questions from the audience. Um, wanted to transition to that. So I guess one of the, the key things also is the supply chain itself, right? So can you talk about the supply chain for the QS ceramic material? Have you secured local supply for key raw materials? Yes, we, we've done um, a number of things when it comes to our raw materials. Uh, you have to identify uh, the correct um, vendor. You have to work with um, third parties uh, as much as possible. Um, if you can outsource a lot of the early stage processes uh, in making a ceramic, like the raw materials, turning those raw materials into a precursor for your ceramic material, those are all bulk processes that you know need high volume equipment. As so we've identified a number of vendors that can do that for us for some of our key components. Right. Um, and and that has been crucial in, in scaling up as well. So and we've also been using what I understand is earth abundant materials to begin with, right? In terms of the precursors themselves. Yeah, a lot of the, the components that we selected, and you, you have a choice of, of different um, raw materials when it comes to, to ceramics. You try to avoid things that are too exotic. You try to avoid materials that you know have a, basically a high cost. I mean, some um, uh, conductive materials have been reported with incredibly high ion conductivity, but they might use a very expensive material like germanium or something like that. Um, so you have to think about the cost of the raw materials. And we've really tried to do a good job on, on, on selecting um, components that we know can be acquired um, in, the, in, the, in the big uh, upstream value chain um, at low cost. So right. a lot of, most of the materials we use have been selected yeah. in that way. Yeah. Um, you talked, this other question that's come in, you talked about high ionic conductivity of your ceramic. Uh, could we comment more on that without getting too proprietary around what the, how high that conductivity is? Well, we can talk a little bit. Um, I think there's some necessary minimum that you need to achieve to have good ionic conductivity. Um, sort of levels of 10 to the minus 4 Siemens per centimeter are kind of a, a mandatory minimum for um, a separator that's going to have you know, a thickness in the sub 100 micron range. Um, well, there's, there's quite a few materials that have been demonstrated and shown to have that level of conductivity. But that, as I said earlier on, that the conductivity is only the first step in mm -hmm. making a solid state battery. Uh, you need so many more material properties to come together to, um, to make the battery work. Conductivity is just the transport of lithium um, through the separator itself. The, the, the uh, lithium also has to move from the anode through the separator to the cathode, and then it faces interfaces mm -hmm. um, going from each one of those media to the other. And the impedance of that um, interface is not always a function of the right. separator's conductivity. It can be a function of so many other things, and you really have to do a lot of work to figure out yeah. what dictates that impedance. So conductivity is important, but it's only the first step. And you know, just for more of the, the layperson and myself and others, but it, you've mentioned impedance quite a bit in this discussion. How would you define impedance for the layperson? Um, impedance is simply the it, it's it's the alternating current version of resistance. Mm -hmm. So 
uh, voltage divided by current gives you resistance. But when you have um, a, an oscillating voltage or a changing voltage, something that's changing with time, there can often be a lag in the response of the current to the voltage. So you describe that system, which is a dynamic response with impedance. So that takes into account the, the frequency of the uh, changes, the rate of change of the mm -hmm. voltage, and um, impedance is the term that we use when you're describing dynamic current voltage systems. Got it. And the lower the impedance, the better for the conductivity within the battery? Exactly. Helpful? Impedance is essentially the inverse of, of, of conductivity. Um, the higher the conductivity of a particular body, the lower its impedance right. will be. And the same for interfaces. The higher the impedance um, of an interface, then the higher the the, the higher the conductivity or the higher the lower the resistance of an interface essentially means it has lower impedance as well. Okay. So the next question is uh, is the QS green body flexible also or just the finished ceramic? Yeah, green bodies um, are can, can be made very flexible. The reason is in the green body you have the opportunity to add in a polymeric binder, for example, that will give you a certain amount of uh, structural or flexibility, and a lot of ceramic processing uses polymeric binders in the in the green stage. So once you mix a little bit of binder in with the ceramic powder, then you can cast all sorts of different shapes. For example, sheets of material that are flexible that can then be rolled up. Um, you can also make um, other bodies that have some degree of flexibility, and the binder can give some. Um, it can give flexibility to it or it can simply add some structural strength to the green body so that it can be handled mm -hmm. or machined. Um, so there's different ways that the green body can be engineered. But certainly they can all be made with some degree of flexibility as well, which, which makes the, the entire manufacturing process a lot simpler, a lot easier to handle. Right. As we work towards a continuous flow process. Right. That's right. Especially if you want to make, for example, long sheets and rolls of material. Right. You, of course, need them to be flexible so they can be wound up. Mm -hmm. And that's a very common uh, practice in uh, ceramic processing and engineering. Right. Okay, so next question. You said ceramics aren't metal, but, cera but can ceramics contain metal? What's the difference? Sure. Um, I think if, if you're talking about pure metals, that's generally the field of metallurgy. Mm -hmm. And you know, historically, we, we talk about metallurgy as being unique from ceramic processing and ceramic materials. But all ceramics are inorganic compounds, which means that they contain typically a metal and a non-metal. Mm -hmm. So, you know, an example would be take titania and oxygen, a mixed titanium dioxide. Right. Take magnesium and oxygen, magnesium oxide, lithium and sulfur, lithium sulfide. These are all inorganic compounds. They all contain a metal and a non-metal. And of course, look at the number of metals in the periodic table. There's, there's you know, a huge array of different combinations that you can put together. Um, barium titanium oxygen that makes barium titanate the capacitor material that we talked about earlier on and there's lots of different uh, combinations that you can make mm -hmm. and even when it gets into the non-metals you can also have inorganic compounds that don't necessarily have one of the traditional metals you can have silicon and carbon that makes silicon carbide boron nitrogen boron nitrate right all very um you know important classes of ceramic materials so you know, they all form inorganic compounds with a net metal and a non-metal, but they're not metallic materials. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I think we touched on this before, but uh, maybe it would be good to go over it again. But one of the questions is, what is the difference between the QS separator and a conventional separator like those used in today's EV batteries? Sure. Well, today's EV batteries use, you know, a 10, 15 micron thick polymeric uh, material, uh -huh. which has a lot of open space and porosity in it. It itself does not actually conduct ions. The, the separator in a lithium ion battery simply uh, separates the anode from the cathode electrically so that they don't touch each other. The ions are actually carried by the liquid electrolyte that permeates through the porous structure of the separator. So it's the liquid itself that does the conduction. In the case of quantum skiff separator, we have a very dense ceramic material there is no porosity, there's no pathway for liquid through it, it's, it's impervious to liquid. Right. But the ceramic itself actually conducts the lithium ions. So the lithium moves through the ceramic lattice between the layers of atoms from one side of the material to the right. other. So it's actually uh, the high mobility of lithium in this crystal structure 
that gives it um, its conductivity. So it's right. a solid state diffusion mechanism, not through a liquid medium. That's the main difference. Right, and uh, maybe we could touch on this just to remind folks, but that those are the properties that then eliminate the essential materials that are there in conventional anodes, right? And allow the lithium, could you talk just a bit about allowing the lithium to actually form a, a solid layer, metallic layer, sure. instead of conventional batteries? So our battery is based on lithium uh, metal anodes. A conventional um, lithium ion battery uses graphite as the host medium on the anode for lithium. So the lithium ions move through the liquid, through the separator, they reach graphite particles on the anode and they uh, diffuse and insert into the graphite lattice. In our case, graphite is completely absent. We use lithium metal. So when the lithium atoms come through our separator, they simply reach a metal current collector and they deposit right there as lithium metal itself. Mm -hmm. And that's how we're able to achieve a big reduction in energy density in our material. We don't need a large graphite right. host lattice for the yeah. lithium. We simply store the lithium on the anode right. itself as lithium metal, which is yeah. you know one of the densest ways to actually store lithium. So actually that's I think you were saying it, but I think it's actually increasing energy density dramatically. Right? Increasing, yeah. It, so you reduce the size of your uh, anode material, mm -hmm. and now you've basically reduced the entire size of your battery itself. Mm -hmm. So you've got the same amount of energy in a smaller space. Right, and then also then, could you touch on the power density aspect? I mean, how, how is that advantageous then from the standpoint of you know being able to charge the car very, very quickly with those EV batteries? Sure. So by reducing the size of your uh, battery itself, you've now managed to reduce the diffusion distance for lithium. So in a normal battery, lithium goes through the separator, but now it has to diffuse through all the anode compartment containing all the carbon and all the graphite. So it has you know, another 80 or 100 microns of diffusion to get to access all that anode storage. In the case of the quantum scale battery, you are depositing lithium right as soon as it exits the separator. So it has no more distance to travel. The lithium is deposited right at the anode interface. So that cuts off an entire, you know, almost half the diffusion distance in the mm -hmm. cell. That shaves off a big amount of, um, you know, uh, extra travel and therefore gives you higher current capability for the cell. So that's the charging aspect, right? Uh, being able to charge fast. Uh, is discharging essentially the same? In discharge is is basically the reverse process. So you have got lithium on your anode, and now you want to discharge, so what you need is for the lithium to leave the metallic lithium and enter into your separator, move through the separator, and then go back to the cathode. And again, it's just, it's the exact reverse process of the deposition. This is called lithium stripping, mm -hmm. and you basically start taking lithium from the metallic anode, and it, it converts from lithium metal, it gets ionized to a lithium ion, and it enters your ceramic separator and starts to move back towards the cathode for discharge. Right. Um, and I think along those same lines, one of the, the key aspects, you know, I think we've talked about cathode flexibility. Um, what is the, the, the property of the separator that allows us to have that uh, flexibility, you know, in terms of different chemistries on the cathode side? Yeah. So the, the unique innovation for QuantumScape has been the separator itself. And the separator is, is, is great because it's, that makes it compatible with a, a lot of different cathode chemistries. We can really put in um, a whole range of, of the common cathode chemistries that you see in lithium-ion technology today, NMC, NCA, LFP. It really doesn't matter. We can substitute any cathode material there that we want. And... Um, combine that with our separator and have that as the, the host to store mm -hmm. the discharging lithium. So, the, we, and we've shown in our in our technology right. that we've demonstrated compatibility with these different cathode types. Right. And is that because the separator isolates the cathode and the anode so distinctly as a solid state? That's right. In a, in a conventional lithium ion, you have to be very careful about um, the compatibility of your electrolyte with both the high voltage on the cathode side and the low voltage carbon on the anode side. In our separator, we know that we're already compatible with lithium metal mm -hmm. on one side. And so, so long as we're compatible with the catholite or the host medium for the lithium ions, 
on the Kathleen side, then we can really adapt to any particular Kathleen configuration that you want. Right. Okay. Going back to, uh, uh, I guess, along those same lines, uh, what does it mean for a cell to be manufactured anode free? And what is required to make a cell anode free? I think we may have touched on this, but just to yeah. reiterate. Well, it's a great question because it's something that often goes missing in discussions about lithium metal batteries. Uh, in many cases, when you assemble a lithium metal battery, you might actually include a uh, foil or, or some uh, a lithium metal in the initial assembly. And this gives you a reservoir of lithium that you can continue to use throughout the cycle life of the cell. But in the quantum scale separator, we actually start off with zero lithium metal at all in the cell. All the lithium exists in that cathode reservoir. And what happens on the first charge of a quantum scale battery is that the lithium leaves the cathode material, it moves through our separator, and it nucleates on the current collector in contact with our solid state separator. And it forms a thin layer of lithium metal itself. And then that continues to grow with further charging. Mm -hmm. And this process um, we've demonstrated now over many years can work very repeatedly. Mm -hmm. It can work at very high rates. It doesn't need uh, significant pressure mm -hmm. to make it work. We've demonstrated very low pressure capability. And um, and it lasts for many, many hundred cycles. Right. So it's a really beautiful process. When we've when seen the first micrographs of this process in action, it was really just quite stunning. Right. So the cell in effect breeds with the, the cell breed. That's correct. The lithium um, will nucleate and grow to its full um, charge state, and then it will discharge again mm -hmm. uh, as you discharge. Right. So uh, one of the questions we got was, how do you deal with irregularities and non-uniformities in the ceramic manufacturing process? Does the separator have to be perfect? Yeah, it, it depends what you mean by perfect. I mean, of course. There are different types of, of flaws and, and in any you know, manufacturing process, in any component, ceramics are no different. You have to recognize what those um, flaws are. You have to recognize where they come from, what's the root cause. And you know, the other thing you need to do, which we've done a great job in, in quantum skip, is trying to assess the severity of particular flaws right. and defects. And that's not easy to do. How do you find a, you know, maybe a microscopic feature and then you know, determine if it is a problem or not? We've got a great team of, um, of, of scientists looking at specific flaws and figuring out which ones are um, dangerous and which ones do we not really care about. Um, I think you know, our strategy has been to uh, make sure that we always um, are focusing on the, most, the worst you know, possible flaws. And the fact that we can set, you know, cycle our, our battery now with you know, good reliability, with high numbers of cycles, I think shows that we've managed to eliminate any particular problems. But with any manufacturing process, you, you will come across different flaws and you right. have to just get on top of them. But the key is to know which ones are more significant than the others, That's which is right. what our team has been focused on. Not all defects are created equal. It's <laughs> a good way to put it. Um, so uh, are PVD processes like sputtering or evaporation required to make the QS ceramic separator? No, they're not. Um, and that's because you know, a lot of these types of processes can be quite expensive when you try to do mm -hmm. um, large volumes, especially for thickness, both PVD and sputtering, mm -hmm. to, to generate large thicknesses that you might need, or certain you know, tens of microns, it can be quite expensive and take a long time to use those processes in, in production. So, you know, from the outset of QuantScape, we tried to make sure that we would only employ techniques uh, that were going to be economical at large scale. Great. Um, you know, uh, battery recycling is a hot topic these days. One of the questions that came in is, can the separator be recycled potentially? Potentially, I think, yes. Um, I think the, um, the principles that are used for recycling of batteries today should, should, um, you know, should be transferable to our material. Potentially even more recyclable because you might be able to extract the ceramic uh, layer itself uh, as one piece and then use it. So I think uh, you know it, it's definitely something that um, is a long-term vision for the company to be able to recycle the cell. Right. Um, uh, at this point, you know we want to get it make make the first generation Absolutely. get it work. <laughs> yes. Get get that out the door. Um, but I think in the long term, I, I don't see any component in our in our battery that uh, could not potentially be recyclable. Great. Um, 
So coming back to the flexibility aspect of it, uh, if this, uh, one of the questions is if the ceramic separator is flexible, could you put it into a cylindrical cell? It's a great question. It, it would depend a lot on the, you know, the radius of curvature that you can achieve and packing efficiency. Um, but, you know, I, I think for our particular cell design, we really like the, the layered structure mm -hmm. and that seems to give us the best opportunity to pack in um, the most uh, energy in a small volume. And you know, our, our current design would, um, would prefer layers rather than a wound structure right now. Okay, great. Well, I think um, with that, uh, you know, uh, we've, we've gotten a number of uh, different types of questions here and covered a lot of ground <laughs> in terms of ceramics. Um, so thank you, Professor Nile, today and Ceramics 101. Welcome. Um, we really appreciate everybody who joined us. Um, again, we will have uh, this available through our website at quantumscape.com as well as on our YouTube channel. And uh, we also published a blog today on ceramics uh, that describes some of what Niall just discussed in more detail. So we welcome everyone to check that out as well. So. Thank you so much, and we hope back hope to be back soon um, with other fun battery topics. <laughs>